Okay, let's uh, make a start. Uh, welcome, everyone. My name is Kevin Featherstone, and I'm the director of the Hellenic Observatory. I'd like to welcome you all here, but also I know that there are uh, a number of people watching uh, online. And indeed, I'm told they're watching online from many different countries, possibly as far away as Australia. Uh, so we have uh, a lot of interest in tonight's event. Can I also say that tonight's event uh, will, is being recorded and we hope to make it available as a podcast for downloading uh, later. So many people are watching live, more people will watch uh, the podcast uh, later. We're here looking back 50 years to the Athens Polytechnia uprising when students confronted the junta. Let me say a few words by way of introduction. All nations create and sustain national stories, myths, if you like, that are shared and passed on. They bind nations together, creating a national identity. They're part of the answer to the question, when is a nation? because a nation can only be said to exist when there is some sense of a shared history. Shared history uh, have symbols, myths, pictures, events as their reference points. Such myths are not always interpreted in the same way and differences can be crucial to the stories. The stories can divide and they can change over time. Tonight, of course, we're reflecting on the student uprising within the Athens Polytechnic in November 1973. <clears throat> it is my earliest political memory of Greece. It forced its attention uh, to students across the world. More importantly, within Greece, of course, over the last 50 years, this event has defined the political trajectory of a generation. It's prompted school closures and strikes as the memory has been kept alive. It's rallied protesters in annual parades uh, across Greece, not least marches to the, uh, in Athens to the American embassy. But there are contrasts, of course, also. For many years, the Polytechnio uprising was canonized. Uh, but then, uh, in the economic crisis more recently, its legacy has at times been savagely attacked. The Polytechnio mobilized a generation. Today, we talk of political apathy. The Polytechnio was about democracy but it never was really linked to a specific political project. So we have contrasts. For the Polytechnio generation, the Polytechnio story became central to the sense of struggle, social change, and aspiration. At the time, in that period, it had no parallel in Spain or Portugal. There's no equivalent Polytechnio events in the collapse of authoritarian regimes in those two countries. So to what can we compare the Polytechnio events? May 1968 in Paris, the Prague Spring of 1968, Tiananmen Square in June 1989. What would be accurate and what would be overblown? Each of these events and histories, of course, are unique. How far the Polytechnio events actually contributed to the fall of the kernels is but one question. It clearly did prompt the shift from Papadopoulos to Ioannidis, marking the beginning of the end. Yet the events themselves in, uh, have taken on wider meanings. They've become part of a bigger whole. The Polytechnic was not actually the first protest under the junta. Students at the Athens Law School had protested against military conscription the previous February. 
But in a way, the Polytechnia events were unique. It was the only major, the only major protest against a military dictatorship that lasted seven years. The students, of course, borrowed their rallying cry from Solomos, Somi pedia eleftheria, but their appeal broadened, anti-imperialism, anti-NATO. And these appeals, these foci, structured Greek foreign policy for at least the next uh, decade. Next year, Greece will reflect on 50 years of the Metropolitanse, how the regime changed after 1974. But tonight, we're going to consider the meaning and the legacy of the polytechnic uprising in the national story. And we have a great set of speakers to help us explore what happened and what was passed on. Zinovia Lealuti is Assistant Professor of Modern and Contemporary European History in the Department of Political Science and Public Administration at the National and Capodistrian University in Athens. She's published a number of books and articles on Greek politics, and she focuses on the formulation of national and political identities. She's focused in particular on the Polytechnia events, to which obviously she will be speaking tonight. I must give the apologies of uh, Professor Calliope Rigopoulou, uh, who for personal reasons can't join us this evening, but I'll read a short note from her of recollections. She is now a Professor Emeritus at the University of Athens. And she says, like the overwhelming majority of those who took part in the Polytechnic Uprising, she was not a member of any political party or organization. She remembers sitting beside, sorry, she remembers sitting behind the gates when a tank stormed in. The tank's turret would make a grinding sound as it turned and aimed at you. At that point, you say, either I'm going to run or I won't be afraid for a while. I think that's what happened to people who take part in such uprising. You're not afraid for a bit. Later, you might take fright at the sight of a, of a mouse, but not at that precise time. Kaliapri Rigopoulou was wounded as police and army troops stormed the campus, arresting students. Yorgos Pavlakis, at the time, uh, was a medical student who tended to um, Calliope Rigopoulou. George is a, a research biomedical scientist at the National Cancer Institute in the United States. He graduated from the Athens Medical School in 1976. He was freely elected as a representative of medical students during and after the dictatorship in Greece. He participated in the student movement and the revolt of November the 14th, 17th, 1973, at the Polytechnic, and he was a co-organizer of the medical facility of the student-occupied school that treated many victims. He was repeatedly arrested and mistreated by the police and was a fugitive after the revolt under the, until the fall of the dictatorship. Nikos Christolakis is joining us uh, online. Uh, Nikos is Professor Emeritus at the Athens University of Economics and Business, and even more importantly than that, he's a research associate at the Hellenic Observatory here at the LSE. During his studies at the uh, National Technical University of Athens, he actively participated in the resistance movement against the military dictatorship. In the Polytechnic Uprising in November 1973, he was in charge of the broadcasting station. After the fall of the dictatorship, he was chairman of the Students' Association from 74-75, and in 1976, he testified at the court martial uh, in Athens against the junta leaders. We have a marvelous panel, and I'm delighted that uh, they've been able to join us either here or online. In order to get things started, in order to help us to focus on the events and then talk about the legacy, We'd like now to, sh to show a very short video of the events. 
Uh, so I'm going to read a statement, a recollection uh, from Professor Kaliopi Rigopoulou. I'm then going to invite uh, Zinovia to speak, and then Nikos Krustolakis, and then Yorgos Pavlakis. Uh, and then we'll have a discussion and we'll open it uh, to you, the audience. So this is a statement from Kaliopi Rigopoulou. Thank you for the invitation to talk about my personal experience of the November 1973 uprising. First of all, it's not easy to draw a clear line of demarcation between the personal and the collective. It's also not easy to isolate the polytechnic experience either from the crucial Greek and international events that preceded or followed it, or from what was done and suffered by the crushing majority of the participants in the uprising, who were not in the precinct, but around it in the neighborhood, or even all around Athens and in other cities in Greece. I will try to isolate some comments, uh, so, sorry, I will try to isolate some moments related to my experience as a participant witness of the events during the last night of the uprising, and also to the consequences of those events for me personally. The first of those moments occurred just a little before the tank broke through the gates and invaded the Polytechnic. As I stood behind the gates, I saw a student, later I learned that there were two, climbing the metal fence that separated us from the armed forces that encircled the school. He was holding a white flag, indeed it was his white shirt, and his aim, as he told me later, uh, was to negotiate the peaceful departure of all of us from the buildings. Although I have no precise information on the matter, I guess he was representing the coordinating committee of the occupation. I nowadays believe that this effort, coordinated or improvised, was well intended, but of course it did not produce any positive results. Owing to the fact that those efforts for negotiations failed, the tank broke the gates I stood behind, opening the way to the armed invasion. It crashed two cars placed behind the gates with all the following consequences. Many aspects of the operation still remain obscure to me. What was the objective of the action? The identity of those that issued the order? the intentions and the feelings of each one of those involved in the army, who later, after I had recovered from the hospital, gave rather unconvincing interviews and expressed the wish to meet me, something which I always declined. The inclusion of the picture and the narrative of the invasion of the tank remains a must for old and recent TV documentaries and a raw material for political rhetorics expressing various ideologies and objectives. The third point I would like to stress is the first medical care I received at the Polytechnic Infirmary and at the hospitals where I was a few hours later, transferred by people risking their lives to do so. I believe that those people performed miracles of capacity and courage. Besides my mother, who immediately became my guardian, my guardian angel, and other people, nursing staff, injured other persons, and their friends and relatives, they stood by me. One night, some of these people trans transported me to another floor of the hospital so that I could meet uh, Spiros Mustaklis. He was the army officer, the protagonist of a patriotic 1973 movement to overthrow the junta who after the failure of this attempt, he became mute and almost paralyzed because of the monstrous tortures to which he was submitted. He, however, found the force to embrace me. Later on, after the reestablishment of democracy, I, thanks to the Greek Social Security Foundation, traveled twice to London to be examined by specialists for the treatments of bone fractures and to undergo 14 separate operations. It was then that Marion Sarafis, eminent Anglo-American archaeologist and historian, widow of the general in command of the uh, Elas 
uh, forces against the German occupation of World War II, gave me the following advice. We women suffer because we are valued on the basis of our family and social status or of the traumas that we have suffered. I urge you instead to try to obtain recognition because of what you do, what you did, and what you create. As a result of the 14 operations and of my firm decision to follow her advice, I recovered the possibility to walk and when necessary, to run. Something which among others enabled me to take part in the demonstration of 1982 on the occupied soil of Cyprus, protesting against the Turkish invasion. And much more recently, after 2010, to take part in Athens against the predatory memoranda imposed upon the Greek people. Kaliopi uh, Rikopoulou's uh, recollections. As I say, we're going to have the recollections from Nikos Christolakis and Yorgos Pavlakis in a moment, but uh, for an overview of the meaning, the significance, the legacy of the Pol Polytechnia Zinovia. Thank you very much. Uh... Hello, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, let me say how extremely honored I am to be here on this very important occasion. I'm going to try to comment on three things. Um, Politechnio as a part of Greek political and social history, Politechnio from the perspective of Greek-American relations, and finally some comments on Politechnio in Greek public history. Um, even though it did not bring about the immediate collapse of the military regime, the uprising and its oppression was a milestone in the history of the Greek dictatorial regime in two major aspects. The first being the internal disruption of the regime, and the second being the attitude of Greek society towards the dictatorship. The uprising was a catalyst in bringing to the fore pre-existing tensions among the dictators and precipitating the overthrow of Papadopoulos by Ioannidis. The latter put an end to his predecessor experiment in limited liberalization and implemented an authoritarian turn during the final phase of the dictatorship. In terms of the second aspect, the suppression of the uprising was decisive in eroding tolerance and somewhat passive acceptance of the regime by Greek society. The brutality of the regime's response to the student uprising brought the end to whatever existing illusions on the dictatorship's character and prospect for self-reform. Moreover, the uprising is a crucial link in the Greek long 60s, which eventually came to an end only in 1974, and in the youth and protest movements of the period. The Greek long 60s involve a protest cycle that revolves around major political developments, such as the contested elections of 1961, the 1965 political crisis that was triggered by the overthrow of the George Papandreou government, as well as by developments on the Cyprus issue also in the mid-60s. In particular, the contestation of the electoral outcome of 1961 gradually evolved into political mobilization that allowed for the convergence between the center and the left in the shaping of social protest. This convergence often transcended the intentions or desires of the political leaderships of the center and the left, and was built on the motivation of their respective electoral audiences. It was centered on the, on the challenging of the post-civil war political setting, which had institutionalized anti-communism. This trend was further strengthened during the 1965 protest cycle. It is worth stressing that despite the limitations in the expression of political protest, the July 1965 crisis resulted in an unprecedented wave of political protest. More than 400 mass gatherings in public space were organized in 70 days. The mid-60s and its aftermath were, in essence, the manifestation of the impasse of the post-civil war political order and of the imbalance between the political and the social structure. As far as the youth component of the anti-dictatorial movement is concerned, two distinct generational groups can be distinguished. The first had experienced the protest movement of the early and mid-60s which had centered on demands for political and social democratization, while the second group had no previous experience in protest movements and had formulated its collective identity during the dictatorship. The radicalization of the second group is revealing for the ideological transformation of the Greek middle-class youth as a result of the experience of the military dictatorship. Nevertheless, it should be stressed that the process of identity formation was not defined exclusively by national events and currents. 
the identity formation of the Greek youth during the long 60s was also shaped by transnational ideological and cultural trends, such as anti-imperialist sentiments, integration into mass consumption patterns, and participation in a cultural universe involving distinct musical, literary, and film products. Despite differences in the Greek political and social context, the Greek youth was, in many respects, like its Western counterparts, also between Marx and Coca-Cola. Moreover, the Greek anti-dictatorial movement had a solid anti-American discourse that allowed for the common framing of the national and the international setting, merging the experience of dictatorial Greece with the experiences of the European and the global South, as well as with the American social movements. For instance, in 1970, Greek students held as political prisoners expressed their solidarity with the American youth, protesting against U.S. intervention in Cambodia, framing American economic, political, and military elites as those who bomb civilians in Vietnam, who murder women and children in cold blood, who support tyrants in Greece and Latin America, and are now ready to turn Southeast Asia into a bloody chessboard. Greek-American relations during the military dictatorship and their aftermath have been widely debated, but it is worth further exploring the youth anti-dictatorial movement under the prism of U.S. diplomacy. The Polytechnic School up uprising is particularly revealing for the gap between the interpretive repertoires of the Greek youth and those of U.S. diplomacy. Since the early 60s, American cultural diplomacy had defined Greek students as a group of particular importance, a group of potential leaders in the realm of politics, science, etc., and had tried to create ties to that particular group through various means. The main idea behind this American project was that Greek youth could and should identify its visions and aspirations for social and cultural modernization with the American model. In this line of reasoning, political anti-Americanism in Greece was often underestimated or misinterpreted because American cultural diplomacy strongly felt that the vision of modernization, mainly associated with the US pattern, would overshadow all other agendas. The modernization thesis, sustained by public opinion research in Greece, conducted under the auspices of the United States Information Agency, were the underlying assumptions of this argument. Based on quantitative data drawn from other biased opinion surveys in pre-dictatorial and dictatorial Greece, American diplomacy was confident that Greek youth interpreted the demand for change mainly as economic growth and rise of living standards. For instance, according to opinion surveys that U.S. officials requested in 1970, 60% of Greeks believed that their country was moving to the right direction and believed that their future would be one of material prosperity. Under this prism, the rise of the student anti-dictatorial movement was interpreted by American diplomacy as a revolution of rising expectations, failing to grasp with its political and anti-American content. A look at the report submitted by the United States Information Service in Athens on July 1973 is revealing for American perception at the time. Quote, any statement by high-ranking U.S. officials to the effect that Greece is a valuable piece of strategic territory and that the West therefore must continue to do business with the regime was invariably exploited by the press to depict the United States as a nation that has sold its democratic principles for the price of an able base. What was then to be done? According to the report, the goal was to persuade a large number of present and potential Greek leaders, particularly the younger elements, that American society is continually evolving and that American cultural and intellectual life is suffused with vitality and the spirit of exploration. Young Greeks, like young people throughout the world, respond enthusiastically to innovation and novelty. Our efforts in this direction have taken the form of youth-oriented programs. Personal contact with youth continues to be extremely difficult. Greek students and other younger people are disinclined to associate with Americans or to patronize American programs because of our political identification with the present Greek government. What could then be done? U.S. officials suggested that the goal was to, persu to persuade present and potential leaders that American institutions and developments in the political, social, economic, and educational spheres are highly advanced and their achievements are applicable to the Greek process of modernization. Making inroads into the non-political aspects of this area is not difficult. This is largely because of the existing hunger for knowledge. Thus, since 1974, American public diplomacy was faced with a paradox. The influence of American culture, economy, science was evident in post-authoritarian Greek society. Nevertheless, this did not prevent the rise of a middle-class anti-Americanism. 
apart from the mass demonstrations, which certainly attract more attention, the symbolic gesture of scientists returning their PhD diplomas from American universities to the US embassy in Athens is also worth noticing. It was the symbolic proof that middle-class modernity could be compatible with anti-Americanism. The Polytechnic School Uprising is an integral part of the national myths of the Third Hellenic Republic. The regime changed, after all, after the fall of dictatorship necessitated a reinterpretation of the national past and national identity. A basic aspect of this process was the question of guilt or innocence of the Greek nation for the establishment of the military junta and for the Cyprus tragedy as well. Anti-Americanism had emerged as a powerful interpretive scheme, not only with reference to the military dictatorship, but also with reference to the entire post-war period and what has been called sickly democracy. An underlying metaphor in this anti-American discourse that sought to interpret Greece's post-war history was the metaphor of occupation. Occupation provided a link of continuity between Nazi occupation and US influence on post-Civil War Greece, which was perceived as a status of limited sovereignty. In this context, the Polytechnio was framed as a link in the chain of resistance episodes that made the history of the Greek people since the War of Independence. The first parliamentary elections of the post-authoritarian period were held on November 17, 1974, on the decision of Konstantinos Karamalis. Address of Andreo at the time claimed that this decision disrespected the memory of the victims, while Karamalis argued that the coincidence between the anniversary and the elections was the best commemoration service for those fallen in 1973. A week after the election, in the context of public commemoration, a march to the U.S. Embassy took place, setting the pattern for the ritual of the commemoration in the following years. Participants in that first march were estimated to one million people. The site of the U.S. Embassy in Athens was designated as the destination of the march, which was both a commemorative and a protest event. This choice, followed by anti-American slogans such as out with the Americans, murderers of the peoples that dominated the march, mirrored the blame attribution process in Greek society since 1974. The commemoration of the Polytechnio can be seen in the context of public history as a means for institutionalizing the memory of, of secret democracy, the memory of the dictatorship and of their anti-American implications. This is not to say, of course, that the perception of the meaning of the uprising was homogeneous. Nevertheless, the Greek left and center left converged in the framing of Polytechnio as a national symbol and as the legitimizing narrative of the Third Hellenic Republic. The speech delivered by the rector of the Polytechnic School in the mid-80s on the occasion of the construction of a commemorative monument for the school students that lost their lives in the World War II is revealing in this respect. According to the rector, by attributing to the uprising of the Polytechnic School the historical gravity of the national resistance movement, we restore the unity, the continuity, and the consistency of the relentless struggles of the youth and of the Greek people throughout the entire historical period stretching from 1941 to 1974. Following the rise of Pasok to power in 1981, the commemoration of the uprising gained further prominence in the public agenda in the interaction between public history and political communication. PASOK sought to sustain the historical continuity between the post-war center, the anti-dictatorial student movement, and the party of PASOK as a representative of the center-left. Andreas Opandreou became the first prime minister to lay a earth on the site of the Polytechnic School, and since that year, 1981, the anniversary became a school holiday. During the economic crisis, the uprising and its anniversary was repoliticized following the cleavage between memorandum versus anti-memorandum parties. The center emphasized the national character of the anniversary, downplaying the external element dimension. Within the anti-memorandum camp, however, the uprising emerged as a present of resistance against the limitations of democracy set by the austerity politics. The junta did not end in 1973 was the slogan that captured this mood. On the far right end of the political spectrum, the memory of Polytechnio is contested. The discourse of the extreme right challenges the historical facts by denying the killing of civilians during the junta suppression of the uprising and insists that this was a bloodless episode. Moreover, throughout the 50 years of post-dictatorial Greece, the phrase the Polytechnic School Generation has evolved into a contested and controversial concept with its meaning constantly changing. What does the phrase the Polytechnic School Generation mean after all? It is used as a metonymy for parliamentary democracy itself, a mirror projecting its virtues and flaws. 
Last Sunday, newspaper Το Vima published an opinion poll trying to capture perceptions of the uprising in Greek society today. 81% of respondents believe that the uprising contributed to the overthrow of the dictatorship, and 76% felt that the uprising expressed mass reaction against the regime rather than being a limited phenomenon. As far as the commemoration was concerned, 86% said that the anniversary should be acknowledged with laying roofs at the Polytechnic School. 79% said that it should involve commemorative activities at schools. And 51% said that it should include the march towards the U.S. Embassy. Finally, as I was leaving the law school building yesterday, the uprising was well alive in the students' memory practices and closely linked to their interpretive schemes of the international, geopolitical, and the national political setting. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. That gives us a, a very nice uh, context. Um, I'm hoping we can now invite Nikos Christolakis to uh, speak to us. Uh, can you hear us, Nico? I think you're on mute at the moment. Thank you very much uh, to everybody. First of all, uh, let me thank uh, the LSE and the Hellenic Observatory for giving me this uh, opportunity to be with you and talk about the anniversary of uh, 50 years of the Polytechnic uprising. Uh, I feel very honored about that. And I think it's time for the uprising to be discussed outside Greece as well as a major political event, which actually has transformed not only Greek politics, but also Greek perceptions about the role of students and about the concept of liberty and independence. This is perhaps the reason behind uh, the appearance of the Polytechnic Uprising as uh, number one uh, event uh, in the last 50 years, as has been presented by the Guardian newspaper uh, a couple of months ago. Uh, also, that was a uh, great recognition of uh, the importance of uh, this uprising. Uh, many things have been said uh, uh, about how the uprising took place and uh, how it shaped uh, political events uh, uh, later on. So in my speech, rather than uh, repeating these uh, issues, I would like to draw your attention to four major issues, four questions, which uh, always uh, come uh, about uh, whenever we talk about uh, Polytechnic Uprising, either in Greece or abroad. Uh, the first and uh, major question is uh, whether the uprising was uh, uh, organized or spontaneous? Was it planned or uh, certain? Uh, my answer to that is that uh, it was a mix of those, a mix of everything, because uh, it's very important to understand that the atmosphere, the political atmosphere, uh, for quite a few months uh, before the uprising took place, uh, was uh, uh, very revolutionary in a sense. Uh, it was very fluid in political terms and very promising uh, <clears throat> and full of opportunities in uh, in 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 inviting uh, actions against the regime. Uh, I think that uh, major uh, events uh, have started uh, uh, since uh, that February 1973, uh, after the occupation of the law school, and uh, also the <clears throat> conscription of uh, about 100 students who were taken uh, uh, out of the schools and uh, were sent uh, to the army in order to try to, to restrain and, uh, and threat uh, the student movement. Uh, but of course, uh, <clears throat> the movement continued and a lot of activities uh, were taking place all the way through. Another major event was uh, the revolt in the Navy, which actually uh, shook the inside of the junta and uh, left a lot of questions about uh, its uh, stability and uh, consolidation. Uh, but uh, I think that the major event which uh, uh, took place before the uprising uh, was the memorial service which uh, took place in the uh, early, in the beginning of November uh, <clears throat> in, uh, with respect to George Papandreou, a very popular centrist politician. Uh, during that uh, memorial service, 
the crowd of students and uh, other people actually were uh, was classed with the police and uh, that was the first uh, case when police actually uh, were uh, running because uh, they were completely unable to control uh, the crowd at the demonstration which erupted after the memorial service. And I think that uh, this, in a way, gave us uh, uh, a signal that uh, the junta is not invisible. And if we coordinate our forces and uh, <clears throat> and 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 uh, strengthen our struggle, everything is possible. So, uh, just one week after this uh, uh, demonstration, uh, there have been massive uh, student assemblies taking place both in the Polytechnic campus and elsewhere in Athens. So there was uh, a couple of days during which uh, everybody was uh, in a sort of fervent that something is just about to happen. Uh, of course, uh, I have to say here that uh, uh, there has been no typical and formal decision about to uh, implement an occupation in uh, Polytechnic campus, but uh, this somehow happened after a few hundred uh, students have arrived, uh, <clears throat> demonstrating through Athens uh, while uh, student as assemblies were taking place. So, uh, in uh, Wednesday night, uh, we see that a lot of people participate also from the outside, and we get the feeling that something much more massive is possible to take place. And I think at that moment, we realized that uh, we are not just a student protest, but uh, we may be uh, <clears throat> in a position to transform it to a popular uprising. So uh, we get organized during that night, of course, with several uh, logistical problems, uh, some classes between us, sometimes violence, but at, at, uh, at the dawn of the next day, Thursday, I think we're in a position to control the campus and also to invite many more students to arrive here and take part with us in uh, the uprising. And at the same time, huge crowds actually gather outside the campus and uh, form uh, a massive popular demonstration against the Junta. This is very important to understand because this is precisely what made uh, this uprising unique and uh, determined its uh, character in the next couple of days. Now uh, I come to the second issue, which is the contents, the character, the targets of the uprising. Well, I, I think about all it was against the gender. Uh, the main uh, uh, <clears throat> demand uh, of uh, students and the people alike was done with Juno. But of course, it was uh, strongly anti-American because uh, everybody was, uh, was, was uh, uh, crediting the United States as being responsible for both staging and uh, keeping uh, in, in, in office the gender. And uh, also because during the last uh, couple of months before the uprising, uh, the US uh, Navy uh, had increased massively its presence in Greece, and uh, you could see a lot of uh, American uh, sailors uh, and uh, <clears throat> and uh, officers working in Athens and uh, greatly offending the national feeling of Greek citizens. And uh, then, of course, it was anti-NATO as well, uh, because uh, NATO was also uh, endorsing Jonda, and uh, from time to time, uh, it was actually uh, <clears throat> so much, uh, uh, so much uh, uh, gratifying it that was uh, also very offending. Uh, but um, uh, apart from the political side, there was also an economic side uh, of uh, uh, demands and uh, protestations. Uh, for example, I remember that uh, there were there were quite a few demands uh, for wage rise uh, because uh, living standards uh, uh, have uh, severely deteriorated uh, at the time. And also there have been some uh, uh, protesters who have gathered uh, in the campus in order to, uh, <clears throat> to, to, to fight against the land appropriation that was taking place in Megara in order to build a huge refinery. 
And this has given a rise into some uh, uh, economic demands as well, uh, especially against foreign capital invading the country and uh, expropriating uh, national wealth. So I think uh, uh, the, the, the content of the uprising was not just uh, against dictatorship, but uh, uh, it was reflecting a wider set of demands and of beliefs, which also uh, shaped uh, uh, its uh, impact uh, in uh, uh, after 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 the, uh, the the fall of Jordan. Another issue which I would like to draw to your attention is uh, the role of the political forces vis-a-vis -vis the political neo uprising. Uh, in a single word, uh, I can describe uh, this uh, behavior as completely disappointing. Most of the political parties either abstained from uh, saying something about uh, the uprising or uh, outright uh, uh, con uh, condemned it. Even the left-wing parties, especially the Communist Party, uh, actually both Communist parties, uh, have strongly uh, condemned the event uh, because uh, perhaps uh, they thought that uh, uh, it was provoking something uh, against them or because they were believing that uh, the should of liberalization that uh, the process was advancing at the time would open up uh, some opportunities, uh, more opportunities for them to uh, increase their uh, influence uh, in the masses. Uh, but also from uh, top politicians, there was complete silence and so the, the uprising was left uh, actually without any uh, mainstream uh, political support. Of course, uh, afterwards, uh, that was a benefit. That was an advantage of the uprising because uh, it was uh, proven to the public opinion that uh, it was clear of political uh, manipulation and uh, any party manipulation at all. Uh, finally, uh, I would like to uh, say a few things about uh, the perennial question if uh, the Polytechnic uprising was the key factor which uh, overthrew the Jonda regime, or uh, was it responsible for the Cyprus uh, coup d'etat, which took place eight months later and uh, uh, brought about the fall of the dictatorship? Well, in my opinion, the coup d'etat, uh, which uh, followed uh, the Polytechnic uprising by some uh, even uh, more cruel. Uh, military forces in Greece by the Onidis uh, group uh, was actually not uh, precipitated by the uprising itself, but it was uh, planned long ago, possibly because uh, they had some uh, patricidal uh, uh, differences or because uh, the Onidis uh, group uh, was uh, strongly opposing the pseudo-liberalization uh, process that uh, Papadopoulos had uh, started uh, a few months ago. So in any case, uh, that uh, uh, coup d'etat uh, was actually planned and was not the result of the uprising. In any case, nobody can plan a coup d'etat just in a week's time. Uh, and uh, the, the other issue about uh, uh, the <clears throat> treason in Cyprus and the coup d'etat, which followed later on there, uh, I have to say that uh, uh, Jonda, from the first moment uh, when it was installed in 1967, it has made a critical target to overthrow the Makarios regime in Cyprus, to actually uh, heart its independence, and to create uh, a situation which was much weaker in defending the integrity and independence of the island. I can uh, say several things about that, uh, from uh, withdrawing Greek forces from the island, from uh, organizing some uh, uh, very provocative events, uh, uh, and uh, in fact, inviting Turks uh, to intervene in Cyprus in several episodes, and finally, actually, uh, by <clears throat> uh, selling off Cyprus uh, and in, in uh, the July coup d'etat. Uh, of course, uh, after the Cyprus coup d'etat, uh, Jordan uh, could not survive uh, any more day, 
But in any case, I think the Politecnio uprising was the key factor which delegitimized any sense of uh, tolerance vis-a-vis -vis the regime. It was impossible for Junta to remain any more, any more months, uh, uh, perhaps uh, even a year or something. But in any case, it was bound for the dictatorship to end after the uprising. Why? Because of so many killings, of so many uh, inhuman fill, uh, killings of uh, young people who were defenseless against the armor tanks of the Jonda. Just to remember that uh, not even the during the uh, not even during the Nazi occupation of Greece was even used armored vehicles against uh, uh, unarmed people. And I think that uh, this showed the cruelty of the uh, of the of the regime and uh, the unbearability uh, <clears throat> in uh, political terms. So I think, in a way, Polytechnic uprising actually signed the end of Jonda one way or another. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nikhil. Thank you, Nico, and we're delighted you've been able to uh, contribute to uh, the discussion and uh, we'll uh, uh, give you the opportunity of responding to the discussion later. Yorgo. Uh, thank you. And um, am, I, am I on? Or... Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, great event. And uh, I'll try to... Uh, not overlap very much with the previous one uh, speakers, uh, but uh, 50 years after Polytechnio, uh, this Athenian popular revolt against uh, the military dictatorship, uh, this is recognized as a significant political event in European history and uh, for some aspects unique, in my opinion. And I must say that the commemoration of the uprising in Greece every year is not a typical uh, public uh, distant memory, but an event that is still mobilizes Greek society one way or another. Uh, the top event is, of course, the demonstration every year from the Polytechnic School to the American Embassy. And many call it a commemoration Others consider it a divisive effect. Uh, it does create tension, uh, which is a sign of an active political process uh, rather than a dry festivity of the past. The side that wants to forget or, or minimize <clears throat> the, the importance of uh, Polytechnio suppresses any evidence of uh, police and army wrongdoing and brutality and tries to discredit the numbers, the importance, and the legacy of the event. Uh, I, am, I am here uh, not as a political analyst, of course, um, but to provide some of uh, our experiences of this period. And first, I would like to focus briefly uh, the why Polytechnio happened that particular time. Uh, that was because um, during that time, the organization of the university students, uh, which were against suppression um, by the military junta, um, uh, that uh, covered all aspects of free expression and association, uh, had advanced. Uh, the organization had advanced. We were a new generation that did not carry the scars in the experiences, the bad experiences of the brutal uh, Greek civil war, a really brutal war that was the first armed confrontation of East and West, uh, while there was still uh, the Second World War going. Um, and of course, the British and the next, and then the Americans won in Greece unequivocally. Later on, of course, um, uh, in Korea, uh, the, the country was divided and remained so. And finally, in Vietnam, um, there was a different outcome. Uh, so um, the point that I want to make about the student movement is that um, uh, we were young, 
did not have the previous uh, uh, experiences of the older decimated generations in Greece. Uh, and um, we had created um, a, a, an organization and trust among us through the bonds that we developed at that time. And that provided a minimal structure uh, to give voice to the widespread disagreement uh, with uh, the uh, the suppressive junta at that time. And of course, during the fall of 1973, as you, you heard before, the dictatorship made an effort uh, for a transition to a kind of normalization, uh, which is a strategy similar to uh, that applied later in Chile by Pinochet that kept him in power for a long, long period of time. Uh, we, as the student movement at that time, more and more um, uh, sure of ourselves, did not agree with that and wanted uh, the dictatorship to end then and there. That was uh, uh, our collective uh, feeling and decision. And this boiling pot of that time, uh, and uh, Nikos um, uh, mentioned a, a key event, uh, November 4th, uh, a demonstration against um, uh, the, the police and the junta um, that, uh, of course, preceded Polytechnic School. Uh, this boiling pot exploded with the occupation of the Polytechnic School in the middle of Athens. Um, we occupied the school and determined to fight the junta to oppose um, the very existence of it. And the exciting thing that happened at that time was that uh, the population of Athens joined gradually the protest by coming in greater and greater numbers in successive days and uh, getting into or around the Polytechnic School joining demonstration and threatening uh, the very existence of the military regime. This converted the event from a student protest to a popular revolt, not only in Athens, but also it started uh, in several other cities in Greece, especially the, the cities that they had universities and student bodies. Um, and uh, especially in Thessaloniki, Patra, and Yanena. Uh, that's something that we should not forget. And that's something that showed that uh, the entire Greek population in, its, in the majority uh, was against the Huda and ready to demonstrate for that. Now, it is difficult for us to describe and give a, a feeling of the exhilaration and the uplifting of these hours that we were together, and also the discipline, the inventiveness, um, the self-organizing, the self-organization that uh, we managed to put together. And that was um, um, driving us to find solutions, and some solutions uh, were appearing from uh, 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 rapidly, like uh, a magic. Uh, people ask me, how did we manage to equip uh, a, a medical facility in hours? And uh, the most likely explanation is by magic and by the uh, coordinate. Uh, movement and discipline of uh, many, many young and old people that they were bringing drugs, bringing equipment, uh, anything you can imagine. Uh, and um, But here <clears throat> I also want to underscore um, the second necessary ingredient um, uh, for this uh, development other than the enthusiasm, the radio station the radio of the free Greek students, uh, which uh, made a tremendous difference because it provided information and communications and inspired many people to join. And of course, uh, Nikos, uh, who I'm glad, he, I'm glad he to, to be here with, um, had a, a major contribution. 
uh, the radio station started very humbly. The first day we were trying to find a way to um, put it together. And that was another example of uh, self-organization together with uh, the food distribution, of course, and sanitation and other form of uh, communications like uh, writing and distributing tricks um, all over. Uh, hundreds and hundreds of young kids were writing uh, and, and reproducing as best as they can uh, tricks. Uh, painting buses that went all over the Athens uh, area. Um, but soon it was uh, the station that carried the day. It was covering more and more of Athens at the end, the whole Athens region. It was supported by um, uh, several or many legal radio stations that were set up by amateurs at that time. Um, um, well, that was not allowed by the Hunda, um, but also by even by telephone. And it went uh, throughout the world, as we know, uh, as far as Australia, um, to Greeks, mainly Greeks all over the world. And this made the difference, in my opinion. In fact, uh, in record time, I believe that we had created a primordial internet before internet, um, to spread our message uh, against the uh, totally controlled media of the dictatorship. And of course, as I mentioned, Nikos uh, had his role in that. Um, and uh, I was fortunate to go around uh, during the revolt uh, in different positions and observe many aspects, including the radio station and also the medical facility. Uh, I was especially charged, uh, or rather, uh, I must say, I took part uh, as um, uh, uh, a group of uh, people, and uh, my task was to organize the medical services uh, together with other medical students. And from the first day, of course, uh, we had some wounded people from fights with stones and um, um, other items. And it was necessary, obviously, uh, to um, with more than a thousand people in the area, in the occupied school, um, that later became several thousand to organize uh, medical care. Uh, but uh, really nothing, nothing prepared us uh, to predict uh, the brutality of the police and the army that Friday night that uh, they started to shoot to kill. Um, and as uh, Nikos mentioned, that uh, uh, hardly happened uh, anywhere in Europe, even in uh, during German occupation, we do not have examples of uh, um, armored vehicles and tanks uh, shooting to kill with, uh, with um, uh, 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 you know, huge guns. In Greece. In the middle of Athens, in, in Greece. Greece, yes. Yeah, of course, there are other places that this happened, but uh, that doesn't make it uh, less uh, problematic and painful. Um, so, um, and uh, one of the, uh, to mention that one of the last severely wounded persons we took care in the makeshift um, um, medical facility was Pepe Rigopoulou. You heard her statement that she suffered for a long time. Uh, actually, uh, I thought uh, uh, that uh, she was probably dead. Um, she was very severely wounded. Her uh, legs were in very bad shape. Uh, and during my long times uh, um, underground, um, after uh, the polytechnic events, uh, uh, that was a, a heavy load on on my psyche. Uh, uh, now, uh, ending, I want to say that um, unfortunately, the English literature in the subject of the polytechnic uprising uh, and what exactly happened, especially uh, the underscoring of uh, police and army brutality. Um, is very poor, the, the English uh, uh, literature. But even the Greek studies 
uh, were lagging. And um, if, uh, I think it's very fortunate that um, several new Greek publications, um, and I have some of them that came out days ago that um, I read again uh, by friends, uh, that um, uh, they describe much, much better what happened and agree, I believe, with the, the picture that we try to to paint here. We know of 24 officially dead, but uh, the, it's commonly accepted that there are several and many more. And actually, uh, it's very uh, fortunate and pure luck, I think, that the, the number of dead is not uh, much, much higher because of the kind of the wounds uh, that uh, they happen. We know of more than 1,300 wounded, many by military uh, guns. Um, and uh, the majority are not students. Actually, a recent study says that probably 60% approximately, they were not students, they were uh, uh workers and clerks and housewives and uh, even kids that went out to the balcony and got shot. Um, so just a couple of words for the aftermath. Uh, I think that um, uh, the events during the Athenian revolt uh, became part of the founding myth of the new Greek Republic, now 49 years old. And um, it has, of course, a very long period of peace and relative prosperity, despite the multiple problems. Uh, so overall, uh, a good development. But um, after the fall of uh, the Hunda, Poly Polytechnio uh, functioned as a, a cathartic ritual where everybody participated, at least in their mind, some fighting the police and the army in the streets, but most of the millions of the Greeks uh, participated at least emotionally, and the radio station is a big, big uh, part of this. Uh, but even this emotional participation just uh, made the Honda um, not tolerable anymore. The, that was the beginning of the end, and, and you heard Nikos, I'm not going to repeat. I agree with everything he said, uh, Hunda finished with the tragedy of Cyprus that is still um, to be uh, uh, arranged, completed, uh, finalized. I don't know how. Uh, but the change of the government removed the army from power, but the overall system remained pretty much the same at the beginning. Most Hunda supporters uh, were protected initially or avoided prosecution and many kept their positions. So um, the lack of this completion of a true uh, rapid democratic transition that happened much longer, much later, uh, the, this lack of catharsis uh, haunted the Greek political system for a while. Uh, and the Polytechnio experience still colors some aspects of uh, life in Greece, I believe, especially the situation at the universities uh, that uh, feel the legacy of these events uh, much more intensely. I believe, uh, though, that uh, this 50-year mark is probably a turning point. New generations are coming along um, that have uh, not a real association with these events. Uh, the Greece of that uh, time does not exist anymore. Uh, and I hope that uh, the Greeks uh, find a way finally to move on from the traumas and the, the, the divisiveness of the past. Thank you, George. Thanks, George, very much uh, indeed. Um, I know we're tight for time. I'm going to ask a few uh, questions which our speakers uh, may wish to uh, take up. Uh, please try to keep your answers uh, short. I'm then going to open it uh, to the audience here, the audience online. I can see questions coming in on the laptop, and I will do my best to have a good range uh, of questions. So let's uh, begin the questions, but uh, please, uh, short answers. And uh, with your permission, we may go beyond uh, the designated time of uh, eight o'clock. Um, a quick question, uh, please, to uh, both to George and Nikos. Uh, 
I wonder at the time, after the 17th, after the uh, quashing of the uh, uprising, in those weeks and months over the next seven or eight uh, months, what your feelings were looking back at the uh, Polytechnio, it's been a defeat. Uh, it had been uh, something with hope. You couldn't possibly have uh, predicted how the junta would collapse or when it would collapse. Was the immediate response of failure or of what, George? Just briefly. Oh, those were uh, among the most depressive uh, times uh, in my life, at least, uh, because, um, well, after the exhilaration and the high that we had at that time, um, here we are uh, uh, defeated and haunted. Uh, I, uh, I was banned from the medical school uh, and uh, was hiding until Cyprus. Uh, and of course, uh, there was no way to say what's going to happen. The examples that we had were not uh, very encouraging. We, I was thinking that we're going to be the next uh, lost generation. And, uh, you know, towards the summer, I was uh, thinking that uh, my career and uh, life in Greece is over. I was thinking about getting a, an illegal passport and and trying to leave. Um, a very depressing times indeed. But as you said, there was no way to predict that. And uh, if it was not for Cyprus, I think that uh, the Hunda maybe, I mean, it was inevitable that uh, it's going to end because it had mm. lost uh, public support, unlike other dictatorships in other places. Uh, the the Greek population was totally against, but no prediction of when it's going to end. Thanks. Nico, your immediate response, uh, uh, hope, failure, what? A short uh, reply. Um, actually, m m most of us were hiding uh, for quite a few months after the uprising in order to avoid uh, <clears throat> arrest. But um, uh, still, we kept uh, on meeting between us. And uh, in every meeting, especially after a couple of months after the uprising, uh, we were uh, thinking of how to repeat uh, some uh, drastic action in order to uh, bring down Junta. So uh, the uprising, uh, of course, uh, has caused some uh, uh, sad, sad feelings because uh, a lot of people were killed and uh, a lot of others who were uh, arrested and tortured. But uh, nevertheless, I think uh, we also got the feeling that uh, dictatorship is not invisible. That was the key which uh, was uh, guiding us uh, in order to organize the next step. And uh, I think that the next step would, uh, uh, sooner or later, would come up uh, uh, if uh, the tragedy of Cyprus had not occurred. So I think that uh, in the in the new academic year 1974, I think that something more uh, organized, a better planned would have taken place against each other. Okay. That was the feeling. Thank you. Um... Kevin, one, one thing I would like to ask. I, I see a lot of questions which uh, are uh, written up in the in the uh, in the Q and A. Yeah, we'll, we'll do we have to, to answer the, these yeah. questions as well now? We'll come to those, Nico. Thank you. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask was that uh, this was all events are unique, but this is a very peculiar event. As you've said, there was little party uh, support, no organized political party, mainstream party supported uh, the event. Um, it's an exceptional form of political mobilization. Students, uh, workers uh, on the outside. It created a phenomenon, a, but a phenomenon which was less than coherent. It didn't have uh, a political project or agenda, defined agenda uh, behind it. 
when we think of that political mobilization of the Politecnico, I wonder in the subsequent years, when we talk about the 70s and 80s, was the fact of that political mobilization, you think, a healthy legacy for the system? Or did it or was the legacy of something which was rebellious but unfocused? George. Um, well, big question. Um, uh, how can I go for a short answer? Um, I think that uh, the majority of the people during this uh, polytechnic school uh, um, uh, revolt, uh, they were not organized formally in political parties, but they had their uh, uh, this situation was changing every day, every week, every month, uh, because, um, and and that was one uh, thing that uh, was behind the thinking of the left parties at that time, a little bit more uh, uh, freedom uh, during the Marquezini's uh, transi uh, and let's say, uh, uh, liberalization um, that Papadopoulos uh, allowed uh, that that would uh, allow better organization. That was the thinking. My point was different, though. A long-term legacy, I don't know whether uh, Zinovia wished to uh, comment on it, uh, it leaves in the system, in the uh, national uh, story, a sense of protest, but not a political project, not a political program. It defines a generation, but uh, it lacks some uh, coherence. Well, this and is... A, and yeah, for a system, yeah, yeah. is this healthy or not healthy? Uh, I, I want to stress out, uh, <laughs> I open a can of worms, but uh, armatoli kekleftes is not a new thing in the Greek system. So uh, what I mean, um, bandits that became freedom fighters... Is a uh, is, is a, 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 a long line in okay. Greece, and they're always popular. Yes, indeed. But you might say in the 19th century, it, it had uh, difficult consequences. Sunibia. My comment would be that, although there are many ambiguities, of course, but the legacy, I guess, for from the perspective of the system, as you described it, is rather positive because... The, the absence of a concrete political agenda means that it can be adapted to several political agendas. And also, let's not forget that the main legacy of the event in the long-term public history is that it provides a conciliatory version of national identity. So in the 70s, in the 80s, when you have to look at your recent historical past and ask who is to blame for the dictatorship, for what happened in Cyprus, you have the Politechnio myth and says, here we have a mass revolt and we all stood for it, we all supported it, we all hugged the Politechnio movement, despite of the historical um, fact there. And it provides a sense of inclusiveness in the perception of what the nation did or did not do in the previous year. So, it offers uh, a very valuable myth that the nation is innocent after all. Yeah. Okay. Uh, a final point from me at this uh, stage. Um, to use the cliche, uh, history isn't about the past, it's about the present. We reinvent, we construct the events from the past in different ways. And uh, Zinovia, in your presentation, you highlighted in the context of the economic crisis much more recently, uh, the phrase, the dictatorship didn't end in 1973. So the the cleavage, the division of the Polytechnio became overlaid with pro or anti memorandum in the context of the economic crisis. What what do you think was consistent or not consistent in in that kind of equation? The the creating a, quite a difficult link between the two uh, events. What do you think is uh, valid, invalid? Well, we can never said 
you know, the characterization valid or invalid is not helpful. I mean, people in different time periods choose uh, the way they frame the past, the way that they select versions of the past to interpret what is happening to them in present time. So yes, it is an overextension of the concept of the dictatorship that I realize that this may sound um, insulting or excessive to many people to equate the dictatorship with the experience of an economic crisis. But our work, I mean, uh, is to try to understand, is to try to understand why people uh, many, many years later choose a particular framing. They choose to equate the consequences of an economic crisis with a status of dictatorship. It is too much, yes, but it is uh, a political reality and we need to look into it and understand the mechanism. So it's about historical analogies. People use historical analogies all the time. And it is a kind of story of half of Greece, isn't it? That's the other half uh, probably isn't in this room. The other half isn't watching online. It's a national story, which is a division. Uh, people are not uh, necessarily uh, engaging with it. Uh, okay, let me remind the online audience that you can send questions using the Q&A facility at the bottom of your screen. And I'm going to open it up to questions here in the audience. If you could try to keep them brief and just identify who you are, and we'll take as many as we can. Uh, Bernard, uh, we need the microphone in front of you. Thank you all for an interesting evening. I want to bring up the tragedy of Cyprus because I was interested in how did views of the participants of the Polytechnic respond following the invasion of Cyprus. And I got the impression that everybody then sort of suddenly solidarized again, but possibly solidarized again with the rejection of a Turkish invasion, but it was an invasion which they had caused. That's the tragedy of Cyprus. And could you comment upon that, please? Any historians? Uh, it was uh, argued earlier, I mean, uh, there was a persistent and coherent strategy of the dictatorial regime against the Macarius leadership in Cyprus. So it would have happened anyway, regardless of the Polytechnic uh, uh, uprising. So I cannot say whether the participants in the uprising felt at some point that they were to blame. I hope not, because that was not their fault. I mean, the, the entire military regime, but especially uh, the Ioannidis group, uh, had a fierce and uh, completely blind attitude towards Makarios. He had conspired um, for many, many months against the Makarios leadership. He would have done it anyway. Well, there are divisions in Greece. Uh, uh, a big conclusion. <laughs> uh, but, uh, uh, you know, the... The people that are against um, uh, the Polytechnic School Uprising, uh, they don't like the music, they don't like uh, the noise, they don't like uh, the dresses, they don't like uh, the demonstrations, they don't, uh, they are ready to criticize everything. Um, and uh, they blame the Polytechnic School Uprising for everything. Uh, Nikos addressed that, I think, in a very good way. Um, the military junta from the beginning had a very, very long-term organized plan for Cyprus. And they finally carried it out to the worst outcome possible. Uh, and we suffer at the, the Cyprus. Cypriots suffer still now 49 years later. So um, that was uh, a plan uh, and we cannot ignore uh, this reality. Uh, to blame Polytechnic School, to blame the people that wanted freedom and their democratic uh, rights uh, because they complained, it is a travesty. Okay, could I uh, ask a question that is coming online? Uh, Professor Dimitris Sotiropoulos. Um, a question for Nikos and uh, Yorgos. You marvelously managed during the uprising to overcome divisions among student groups and forge unity. Nowadays, unfortunately, the commemorations of the uprising, particularly during the annual rally in Athens, are deflected to violent political activism by very small marginal political groups. 
is there a hope and a strategy to rescue the commemoration of the uprising from such groups? No, it's um, it's part of the uh, ecosystem. Uh, they've been in, in the ecosystem in many places in 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 Europe and throughout the world. Um, sometimes good ideas come out of um, uh, unlikely places. I am against this type of violence. I'm against uh, the 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 chaos and and dirtiness and. Um, Etc. Etc. In 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 Greek universities, I say that, uh, and Kevin, I hope you remember it <laughs> for a long time uh, uh, that uh, we have to have more discipline in Greece. Uh, and uh, but um, you know we have to accept uh, that uh, as part of the ecosystem. And uh, I I think that. Uh, the police and the, and the state uh, could have a little better um, uh, management on that. I think uh, events are exaggerated or <clears throat> to just discredit the mainstream. Okay. Nico, can I bring you in on this uh, question? Yeah. Uh, in, in a few words, uh, I think that uh, this situation is a disgrace, both for uh, Greek uh, universities uh, university staff uh, and uh, the Polytechnic uprising as well. I think actually it is a, a very well organized uh, defamation uh, technique uh, because uh, the methods which are used by the uh, marginalized groups, uh, anarchists and uh, other troublemakers are in complete antithesis of the ethics which prevailed in the Polytechnic uprising. Uh, I think that uh, we avoided violence completely during the junta and uh, the, uh, there is no place for violence in uh, the democratic era. Uh, I think that uh, myself uh, has uh, very frequently opposed uh, this violence and uh, when I was director I remember that uh, I didn't dare to uh, uh, <clears throat> to 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 tolerate such things, but uh, actually I uh, I invited uh, the police uh, to clean up the situation. So I think that uh, uh, there must be no tolerance at all against uh, this uh, disgraceful behavior in the universities because it's not in pursuit of freedom, but it is in pursuit of destroying university liberties and uh, the rights especially of the poorer uh, of the of the poorest people and students to acquire uh, a level of education which uh, is going to be essential in their lives and careers uh, i think uh, there is a, a malign alliance between uh, uh, a group of professors who have uh, actually collaborated with junda uh, who were very uh, very very prompt tolerate violence by um, <clears throat> troublemakers uh, a few years after the uh, democratization process started in Greece. Okay. In exchange of their uh, <clears throat> somehow uh, acquisition, uh, acquittal uh, from their uh, collaboration with John Dell. Okay. So I think that uh, this uh, style, this, this environment which prevailed in the universities uh, should be strongly condemned yeah. uh, first by us who took part in the polytechnic uprising but also by every student and every professor because yeah. otherwise the future of uh, universities is going to be undermined okay thanks and this is going to be detrimental above all to the people who want to, to make them benefit from higher education yeah Okay, thanks, Nico. There is a, another question specifically uh, for you, if I may. This is uh, from Professor Dimitris Papadimitriou. Uh, I think this is the first time I've ever heard you speak about the Polytechnio events. Why, over the course of your life in politics, have you apparently found it so difficult to speak about the events of 1973 in public? 
you're you're on mute. Seems to be adding to the question. You're on mute. Uh, two things I have to say to my friends, uh, Dimitris Papadimitriou. Uh, first of all, I hope that uh, I have not spent uh, most of my time in politics, but in academics. So it was only about a third of my life in politics. Second, that uh, I have uh, frequently spoken about that in Greece and also abroad. I have given speeches in France, Italy, and also in UK sometimes. Here at uh, LSE, I remember when I was a student in Cambridge University, I was also invited uh, in some other uh, uh, cities in the UK, but I, I was never invited in Manchester to give a public lecture on that. So okay. uh, in case that uh, Dimitris uh, is willing to do that, uh, I promise that I will positively respond to that. That would be very courageous of you, given the weather in Manchester. Uh, let's take some questions from uh, here. Uh, Manoli at the very back, but if you could just uh, uh, thank you. identify uh, yourself. Manoli Galenianos uh, at the University of London. Uh, this is a question, I think, mostly for uh, Nikos Christodoulakis. Um, so you mentioned that um, you did not receive any support from um, uh, polit politicians, uh, so pre-junta politicians. I was wondering, uh, did you want their support? Did you try to elicit their support or uh, did you reject them? Uh, did you not care to have their support? Okay. I, I think that uh, this is a very, very crucial, very tricky question. Thank you very much for uh, for for uh, saying that. Uh, First of all, we offered some type of support by some politicians. For example, by uh, Mr. Kanellopoulos, who was the last prime minister of Greece before uh, John Dehr, but uh, it was actually uh, not accepted. And uh, <clears throat> also we had an offer by Constantine Karamalis at that time to speak uh, from our uh, radio station, but also that was uh, turned down. Uh, there was a big fight in the coordinated committee uh, whether we shall uh, appeal to the three figure politicians, Karamalis, Mavros, and Iliou, representing uh, the Conservative Party, the uh, Centre Party, and the Left Wing Party, in order to support our uprising and take initiatives. But uh, after a very, a very bitter discussion in the committee, that was also rejected. Uh, so, uh, we thought that uh, if they wanted to support us, they could do it by themselves without uh, us to appeal to them. Uh, at the end, I think that this in turn out to be an advantage because we could claim later on, and that became clear to everybody, that our uprising did not have any partisan motivation or any partisan uh, participation. I think that the, the strangest of all things was uh, the lack of uh, support by the communist parties, both communist parties. Uh, perhaps they were too much afraid that something would happen against them. Uh, uh, after, after a number of years, I have thought a lot about that. Perhaps uh, there were such a short period after the civil war, after only 24 years have passed since the end of the civil war, uh, during which the Communist Party was heavily defeated, and perhaps they were feeling that uh, a new uh, period of uh, of, of uh, misconfort and uh, uh, chase uh, and uh, pogroms uh, may may follow. So, uh, so they choose uh, to stay away, but also uh, they condemned that one. Uh, especially the uh, pro-Soviet Communist Party condemned that as a provocative action. And that, I think, was an unforgivable political error. Of course, a few months later, they changed course because they saw the vast uh, uh, adoption of the uprising by people and by public opinion, uh, who was uh, very moved uh, as they saw a uh, defenseless student uh, coming out to protest against the uh, gender, and uh, actually they like that. But anyway, at that time, I don't think that the political support by uh, mainstream political parties would have made any change to the immediate impact of the uprising. Okay. Um, and uh, <clears throat> that Thank actually helped us uh, to keep our identity uh, more clear 
And uh, I think that this uh, convinced more people to espouse uh, our ideas and yeah. uh, beliefs. Okay, thanks. We could simply note that the uh, Communist Party in France did not support the protests in May 1968, for example. Anyway, uh, Vasily. Uh, uh, oh, I think there's a separate microphone. Uh, thank you. A bit of open question for, for, for the panel. I, I think you all seem to... to 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 agree with, with the idea that you know we the the narrative of Politechnio is losing its relevance, so we need to uh, kind of move on. I think uh, there was also the suggestion that you know, fifty years on, we we entering a, a different era where the Politechnio is not relevant anymore. And I want to provocatively ask: Do you think this is because the objective institutional you know the problems that the uh, Politechnio uh, that you uh, fought against, demonstrated on, uh, are not there anymore. So obviously we don't have military government, maybe we don't have police brutality, we don't have American interventionism and so forth. Or is it that the, the, the mindset and the aspirations of the people, so if you want the individual objective conditions have changed and they're not, so these demands are not popular anymore. So to, to use the, the very nice reference that uh, Zinovia had, uh, is it that Marx became irrelevant or that Coca-Cola won? <laughs> Well, yeah, do you want to... yeah. yeah, thank you. Um, there is this uh, phrase uh, describing, you know, the role of historical memories and says that we have hot and cold historical memories. So when uh, crucial events like Politechnio becomes a sort of cold memory, it's a good thing. It's a good thing that we don't have uh, a recent dictatorship or such an experience to relate to. Uh, on the other hand, I would say that the Politechnio uh, memory is still very much alive. I mean, I sit with my students. It's really amazing how it captures their political imagination, of course, in very different terms than the previous generations, but it is a very important narrative to them. And uh, they build their identity, they build their political presence, their uh, sense of debate around that myth. And I think that is very important and you don't have that with other historical events. So I'm not, I don't see it losing its importance. And it's also very impressive that now with the 50 year anniversary, we had a series of publications, very good publication, bringing new elements uh, to light. And this is also very relieving. And uh, and I agree with uh, a remark made by Janssonas Kandrinos, and he said, there is still a lot that we do not know about the events of Polytechnia, and there is still a lot to research. Okay, thanks. Well, I think that's a very good point to uh, to close on, if, uh, if forgive me. However, uh, we're very pleased to invite you to a wine reception outside, and I'm sure uh, George and uh, Zenovia would be happy to continue uh, the discussion. Unfortunately, Nico, uh, we cannot invite you to the wine reception uh, next door, but we're very, very pleased you've been able to join us. And uh, can you can I ask the audience to please uh, thank each of our speakers? Uh, thanks very much. Uh, last point to mention I'd forgotten. Our next event as the Hellenic Observatory is on Monday, the 27th of November uh, at 7.15. And we have the current foreign minister of Greece, Yorgos uh, Yara Petritis, uh, coming to speak to us. Thanks very much.